uh, going to address issues surrounding uh, the uh, future of uh, human spaceflight and the, in particular, uh, project uh, the 100-year uh, Starship. Uh, and uh, joining me today, I'm, my name is Adrian Brown, by the way. Uh, joining me today, I have to my right here, Richard Rhodes. Richard is the uh, author and, and uh, editor of uh, 24 books, including uh, The Making of the Atomic Bomb, which won many awards. Uh, and he's received numerous fellowships for research and writing and has a, been a visiting scholar at uh, MIT and Harvard. Uh, and then uh, to our right, we have Bill Nye, who uh, really needs no introduction, the science guy. <laughs> one, of, one of the uh, best explainers of science in the country uh, and also the director of the Planetary Society and also an engineer who worked on the 747 uh, double rudder system or something like that with great supervision as we just heard at lunchtime. And uh, then to our right we have Dana Backman. Uh, Dana is a, uh, is a scientist at uh, the SETI Institute. Thank you. <laughs> SETI Institute! And I, and I he's, like he's manager of the uh, SOFIA uh, uh, Airborne Observatory EPO project and uh, an infrared astronomer whose interests uh, lie in the field of planetary systems nearby stars with debris disks and, uh, and the evolution of our own solar system, in particular the Kuiper Belt. And then uh, our final panelist is uh, Mae Jemison, also a neat, uh, no introduction, but... Uh, <laughs> but May, uh, May is now the, the director of the, uh, the project for the year, of, uh, sorry, for the 100 year Starship. And uh, um, I'm going to make sure that I get the right bio read out here. Uh, ast an astronaut. They must be having more. Fun. An astronaut above the. Uh, we'll we'll get to our fun bit, Bill. Uh, an astronaut aboard the shuttle Endeavour and the first African American woman in space, and she also played, uh, as we found out last night, Lieutenant Palmer on Star Trek: The Next Generation. Uh, and. And we'll be using her expertise as the leader of the 100-year Starship uh, program uh, today. And in fact, I'm going to start with you, uh, May. Um, could, you, could you give us a, uh, a rundown on how, how uh, the 100-year Starship project came about and, um, and what's, uh, what's your involvement in it? So, uh, good afternoon. It's really exciting to be here. It's always interesting about how you're introduced, and I'm just going to start that off really quickly. Tell you a little bit more about my background, um, which influences very much about the makeup of how we decided we wanted to do 100 Year Starship. My background is I'm a chemical engineer as an undergraduate, but I also majored in African and African American studies right up here at Stanford University. It's where I went to school from Chicago. And then I'm an MD. I'm a physician uh, from, from my background and training. And I worked in developing countries. I worked as a doc who took care of Peace Corps volunteers and State Department personnel in Sierra Leone and Liberia for a number of years, as well as having worked in Cambodian refugee camps, going to NASA as an astronaut. Uh, leaving NASA, I went and worked on sustainable, as an environmental studies professor at Dartmouth College on sustainable development and started a technology company and some other things. I wanted to bring those and put those in perspective because they have very much to do with what 100 Year Starship uh, represents and how it was so congruent with some of the, our other team members. So 100 Year Starship is an initiative from DARPA. DARPA is a Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency of the Defense Department. And they're the ones who brought you the internet and global positioning satellite systems, just to sort of name some things that you might be familiar with in your everyday life that are very uh, far cutting. DARPA and NASA Ames work together to create this initiative to look at how do we ensure that we have the capacity to send humans to another star system within the next hundred years. So during the next hundred years, how do we make sure we have the capability to send people to another star system? And the process that worked out was there was a, um, a call for papers. I'm sorry, there was a RFP, a, a request for proposals that DARPA put out um, in August of last year. And the proposals were due in November, and they actually um, 
they didn't actually announce the, the person, the group that won the proposal until a bit later. But anyway, the team that I was leading won the proposal. <laughs> and out of uh, quite a few. And I was, had the pleasure of teaming with a really great group of people. Um, our foundation, the Dorothy Jemison Foundation for Excellence, is the prime on the project. And we've done a lot of work with uh, education and outreach and um, uh, science education. We're also chaired with uh, Icarus Interstellar, which is a group of astronomers, astrophysicists, engineers, aerospace engineers, and people who want to make a difference in terms of creating an interstellar probe. And they've been working on this project for about two years. It was called Project Icarus, and they've been working on it for about two years, uh, even prior to uh, the announcement of 100-year starship. So I was very lucky to be able to team with them and that we were able to found each other. And there's a Foundation for Enterprise Development, which is an organization, a nonprofit organization, which looks at the govern issues around the surrounding governance of technology and innovation companies. And so those are the teams that are working together. Our, the name of our proposal that won was an inclusive, audacious journey transforms life here on Earth and beyond. And the idea behind it was, again, that if we're going to do this, we know that it's not going to be done just by one group of people. It's going to require that there's a full range of talent that is involved in it. We also consider that it, this is really an inspirational journey. This is something that has to be a global aspiration. Um, no one country is probably going to do it. It's going to require quite a bit more than that. When we look at the foundation, when we look at how this works, we actually decided that the components of it would be a nonprofit foundation that will create that will set up right now. The Dorothy Jemison Foundation for Excellence is that nonprofit. We will be putting together an independent nonprofit organization that should be coming out within the next year. So there's a nonprofit foundation. Underneath that, or part of that, is a research institute that will help to promote cutting edge research, bleeding edge research. We know we're not gonna be able to do all the research that has to happen, but someone has to advocate for it. Somebody has to say whether it was uh, what we're hearing about, making sure we're still can, uh, looking at planets, looking at different kinds of energy production. So there's a research institute that's going to help to promote things around the world. We'll have the capability for spinning off uh, for-profit enterprises as they come about and need to be. We'll have an advisory council. Our advisory council will compose, be composed of not the necessarily the usual players. So yes, there'll be people who are involved in the sciences or people who are involved in um, space exploration in general, but we'll also be looking at individuals, sort of, uh, one of the people who's involved is a, a man named David Tweedy, who's second in charge of the World Trade Center uh, being rebuilt. Why? Because it's a large project that has a lot of emotional components to it, has a lot of policy issues associated with it. So we'll be working with those kinds of expectations as well, making sure that we know this isn't just something that's going to happen because you get the propulsion right. It requires that you get the behavioral sciences right. It requires that you get the economics correct. What are the economics of starting a new civilization somewhere else? What are the economics of investing in a technology that's not going to be used here on Earth necessarily in terms of the long run? The other part of this is that we do want the technologies to be used here on Earth. Because every step of the way, we know that we have to enhance and improve life here on Earth. That's a big portion of it. When we um, start to look at other things, I want to just say that we have also committed to work with many other people. And in fact, some of our partners include, well, first of all, we're really proud that SETI Institute was one of our partners. And in fact, a very special partner, SETI will always have a place on our advisory council because it's really important that we work with an organization that's been around doing things that people, other people were afraid to do for a long period of time and helping us think about the world differently. We'll exchange uh, research fellows as well. 
We've been working with organizations like Change the Equation, which is a group that's looking at science literacy reform around the world, the British Interplanetary Society, the Texas Medical Center, the world's largest medical center, and also the National Human Performance Laboratory. Of course, folks like Nichelle Nichols, Lieutenant Uhuru on Star Trek, Texas Southern University, who also um, has prop is working with us to create radio programs and, uh, on their um, public radio station. This isn't going to just happen in the United States. We're working with the Da Vinci Institute out of South Africa, which is an organization that looks at systems research and what, what is the importance of systems. Uh, the Beautiful Life Development Foundation out of Shanghai, China, uh, works very closely with sustainable development. Uh, Rice University, Morehouse College, Denver Museum of Natural Science. So these are just a few of the organizations that we're really working with to pay attention to how to move this forward. Those partners aren't, will work on specific projects with us, but we also want people who are going to just be out there talking about it. They're artists, they're entertainers, they're titans of business. These are folks who can make a difference right now. So we want to have that uh, consortia of all kinds of other individuals working there. There are lots of challenges that are associated with this, and we can talk about those a little bit more. The challenges range from um, the purely physical and the physics of it all, all the way to what is human and whether or not we should even do this. So those are the pieces. Our task is not necessarily to create the vehicle that's going to go, but to make sure that if someone within the next 100 years decides to mount a mission, that the technologies are there and in place. And the last thing I want to do is just to tell you one other piece about what we're doing. So we're sort of starting out um, doing this on the run because we want to follow up on the momentum of all the things that have been happening over the past year and as 100 Year Starship came out. And so we're actually holding a symposium in Houston, a public symposium on 100 Year Starship in September, and we can give you more information on our website. But I just want to let you know that because it's important that we all get involved. Thanks, Mayan. <clears throat> I just wonder if we could uh, touch on some of those technology challenges. And uh, Richard, if I could start with you, you're a, a world-renowned expert on uh, atomic uh, technology, and, uh, and perhaps you could talk to us about the, what the potentials are for nuclear uh, science on board. Good. Uh, I thought, it, since I'm basically a historian, I thought I would approach this as if it were some history that I was looking at and was planning to write about. Uh, pretty clearly, the power system for a starship isn't going to be able to carry enough fuel. So I think of this in terms of a three-stage system. First of all, whatever is going to be built is assembled in orbit, probably at the Chairman Mao Memorial Gaming Sport and Starship Assembly Center in, in orbit around the Earth, or perhaps it's the Elon Musk Memorial, one or the other. Uh, The engine that's going to get this system out of our planetary system could well be a nuclear reactor with fuel, presumably hydrogen. But once it's out beyond the solar system, then we need something a little more sophisticated. There is such a concept. It's uh, a nuclear power reactor that basically uses the black body radiation, the heat coming off the reactor as the propulsion mechanism. Photons can push. It's not a very big push. But those of you who've looked at these long, long range propulsion systems know that as long as you have a steady push, you slowly get to accelerations that are truly phenomenal hundreds of thousands of miles per second. So if you can imagine just a very hot radiator on the outside of a nuclear reactor, then I think you have a propulsion system that paradoxically doesn't need any fuel other, of course, than the fuel in the reactor itself. 
for that, uh, the reactor I have in mind is one that was called the IFR, the Intermediate Fast Reactor, designed by the boys out in Idaho with the leadership of a Canadian engineer named Charles Till, uh, which was, and I don't say this as a conspira conspiracy theorist at all, but simply as a fact, which was basically suppressed <laughs> early in the Clinton era uh, because it was not something that evidently our government wanted to build. It used fast neutrons. It had about 20% fuel burn up instead of the one or two or 3% that regular uh, light water reactors have today. And another innovation, which is in fact coming into use now, uh, was called uh, electro separation. There was, uh, the, the, the fuel that needed to be recycled was basically put into a pot with some nice strong conductive liquid and then you could, using electro, electric processes, pull out whatever you wanted to pull out from the spent fuel. It, it was nice for use on Earth because it left you with material that was so highly radioactive that no one was going to carry it off in their pocket and use it to make a bomb on the side. But as a system, it was compact, straightforward, uh, something that would fit very nicely in the self-contained power packs unit. And then the question, of course, is how do you keep the radiation from the reactor away from the people inside? And there I draw on the inspiration of Curtis LeMay and his idea of an atomic airplane, which was a hot item in the Strategic Air Command in the early 1950s. Uh, fortunately, eventually uh, uh, abandoned. But, but the idea was that since the reactor that was going to power this, this strategic bomber was going to be pretty deadly, it would be back on a pole about 150 feet behind the plane. No one really talked about what would happen if the plane, as inevitably planes do, might crash. But we fortunately won't have that problem since we're going to have this system outside of Earth, Earth orbit. And if something goes wrong uh, and the thing has to be dumped, it can just be dumped into solar orbit. Or once we're out of the solar system, just left to sail off to wherever it might sail off. So with this combination of existing or at least conceptually existing technologies, I think you have a power system that would do the job. You'd have to carry, of course, quite a bit of extra, extra fuel. Uh, that doesn't seem to be a problem if you were talking about something of the sheer scale of a starship that's going to carry people. Uh, the only other thing that I thought about was my experience in writing about technology is that the really interesting phenomena are the unintended consequences. That seems to have much more to do with where we go with technology than the intended consequences. So what are the unintended consequences here? The one that comes most to mind is the extent to which a system like this is going to use robotics and the intelligence of the, the robotics. It seems to me we have the possibility 100 years down the road with this very important mission to, we presume, an inhabited planet somewhere far away, that the robotic systems themselves are going to insist on some kind of, of human rights, of, of human rights, of intelligent rights, let's call them, that this is going to be a moment in human history where all of these intelligent systems that we've slowly been constructing are going to insist that they have an equal share in the process particularly since the likeliest life forms we're going to find on an advanced system somewhere else will be uh, machines, not, not, not something so squishy and, and difficult to deal with as, as biological organisms. So I, I leave you to think about that, or all of us maybe, to talk about that. But for power, nuclear power is obviously the way to go. Nuclear fusion would be, but 100 years from now, it's still going to be 20 years down the road. I, uh, Adrian, I, I know we're going to move on, but I'd like to just do something for a second, because in terms of talking about technologies, one of the biggest things that we're doing as we're going forward is to leave things open so that we have an opportunity to 
see if the, we get further on it. And I want to uh, just say a couple things that, you know, the physics of doing this is possible. The reason why we talk about using other kinds of fuel systems, because you can't get there with chemical rockets, as we sort of talked about last night. But what I'd love to do is to ask someone in the audience who's not on the panel to just make a comment a little bit about the different kinds of energy systems we could do, whether it's fis fission, fusion, or matter, antimatter, who's been working with us, and who I count on, is uh, Dr. Richard. Um, Obusi, who is the president of Icarus Interstellar. So if Richard could you give us just two minutes. I know he's not on the platform, but he's going to my proxy, like the congressman, Congresswoman Yields, the floor. In, we'll just, we'll just, just give this one. Just a second. Just this, just this one time. I promise okay. you I won't do it too many more times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who, who else is hidden in the crowd, I wonder? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been a strong supporter of this, uh, the SETI mission so Hold as long as I can remember. Um, I think really it's important to frame uh, the problem may articulate with clarity yesterday and the real problem when you want to engage in missions of an interstellar, uh, interstellar nature are the vast distances that separate us from even the closest star systems and, and as May said yesterday uh, Voyager 1 one of our fastest outgoing probes traveling at about 38,000 miles per hour would take about 70,000 years to reach one of the closest stars if that were its destination and, and it's not and the problem is that we're currently using chemical rocket fuel chemical rocket propulsion which is wonderful at liberating vast amounts of energy in a very short period of time. It's great for getting us into Earth orbit, but pound for pound, uh, we know of far more uh, energy efficient ways of liberating energy from matter. So if we want to engage in interstellar missions on timescales on the order of, say, a human lifetime, say 50 years or so, um, you can plug in the numbers where you need to reach speeds on the order of about 10% um, the speed of light. Now that's actually physically impossible using chemical rocket fuel. If you plug the numbers into the Tsiolkovsky rocket equation, uh, you, you actually determine if you if you were using chemical rocket fuel to travel at about 10% the speed of light, you would need more fuel than there exists energy uh, mass in the known universe. Now that sounds like a problem, and it is obviously obviously a problem. But we know of uh, other ways to liberate uh, energy from matter that uh, give us uh, pound for pound a million, tens of millions, or even billions of times more energy pound for pound than if we use chemical propulsion technology, namely uh, harnessing or liberating energy from the nucleus of the atom. So gentlemen today uh, alluded to uh, nuclear fission technology, nuclear fusion technology. It's something that works. You know, human beings, we haven't mastered the technology, but you just look up in the sky and you know that nuclear fusion works. It's what powers our sun. Um, there are ways to circumvent the Tsiolkovsky rocket equation, namely beaming energy. Uh, there's an expert in the audience, Jim Benford, who works on beaming energy uh, to a sail-like structure, which is a way you can achieve appreciable fractions of the speed of light. And even matter, antimatter uh, annihilation is, an, is the most efficient way, effective way to liberate uh, energy uh, um, from matter. So again, we're only creating on the order of a few trillionths of a gram of antimatter per year in particle accelerators. But the point is that there exists out there ways within orthodox physics, within the known laws of physics, we don't have to go out and create warp drives or wormholes. The, the, the physics exists, we just need to sort of like develop that technology arc, as, uh, as May Jemison alludes to. So that's really what I wanted to pass on. Thank you. Thank you. So. Bill, we've, we've heard about some of the uh, propulsion technologies. Uh, could you talk to us about uh, some of the other technology tall poles that might be out there and in a uh, well, way? Well, thank you all. But I think that we are really thinking in the box when we think about the spacecraft carrying its own fuel. I really, I, I grew up at a time when people were going to uh, send a solar sail to uh, to uh, Comet Holly, formerly Halley's Comet. And uh, this, the way you would have it is a whole civilization would participate in this, that you would have a giant, at our current level of understanding, laser that would point at this thing. And even though the Earth's going around the sun and everything's moving uh, with respect to the fixed or the distant stars, you'd still be beaming this thing at this spacecraft. Okay, that's huge, big fun to think about, I must say. And the other thing that I find just ever so charming, I uh, interviewed Saul Perlmutter for a television show, and this is one of the guys who discovered, who went out to find out how much the universe is slowing down. You know, the Big Bang, everything goes out, so then you'd expect it to slow down because of gravity. 
Well, it turns out it's not slowing down. It's accelerating. And do you know why? Nobody knows why. Yeah. <laughs> And so it is quite reasonable to me that, some, that there will be discoveries. And as a guy who took a lot of physics, as a, in physics, you know, all science is physics, there will be discoveries <laughs> in astrophysics uh, that, will make, that will make the way we think about this problem obsolete. But then in the meantime, there are just some other fundamental, if you're going to send people, and I have to say, as a human, I'll just say some of my best friends are people. <laughs> Even... Uh, there's considerable evidence that even my old boss uh, was human. <laughs> it was time when I wasn't sure, I'll confess. Uh, that we need something that spins. We need a spacecraft that spins. We gotta create artificial gravity, and this would be fun. That is to say, in the name of the 100-year starship, we develop other technologies that would allow us to go to send people, especially for me, to Mars. And for those of you who volunteer to go to Mars one way, and I know there are a few of you out here, I really encourage you. It's the problem. It's, it's if I'm, I don't want to shock anyone, it's freaking cold. All right. <laughs> then they don't have anything for us to breathe if you go there. So I really encourage you to try live in Antarctica for a couple years. It's really difficult to spend a winter in Antarctica and... Uh, don't go, no, 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 no. Don't go to where the seals and the penguins are having fun. No, no. You go to the dry valleys where there's just, there's not even sure there's microbes there. You try that for a couple of years and then we'll take this meeting. But in the meantime, my belief is to use the 100 year starship program to uh, extend these intermediate technologies that you would need. And the other, the big thing, apparently, people have a hard time getting along. Uh, if you put everybody in, if we had everybody in this room on a spaceship, it wouldn't be long before we had, you know, some conflict. And I know one of you is about to say, no, we would not have conflict. Yeah. <laughs> so these are big problems, and I think we can use the 100-year starship idea to develop this way to go to very difficult but much more immediate destinations. Thanks, Bill. Um, <clears throat> oh, sure, yes, thank you. <laughs> Dana, can you, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, potential uh, destinations for that's the right. Starship? Uh, that's a good thing. That's what my notes are about. Right, isn't that yes. Right? And I'll, I also, I have a little uh, bit about uh, uh, J uh, May's other question last night about who we would take along. So, um, well, so I've wanted to be on your staff since the fourth grade when I read Robert Heinlein's novel, Time for the Stars, which is about a fleet of uh, starships uh, uh, sent out in all directions to investigate uh, solar-like stars looking for, for Earth-like planets. And these uh, starships uh, boosted at 1G. They had an engine that would do that, and so they didn't have to spin it. But they had, the, the, the protagonist was a, a, a one member of a, a pair of twins who were used as a radio communication device. They had telepathic no. twin <laughs> communication, which it turned out went fa at instantaneously. It's like subspace like, radio. Uh, sub subspace quite radio. a bit like subspace radio. Well, my, I and guess that's why they didn't use subspace, because they, right. yeah, they had that. Yeah, they had that. But the, uh, the, this, was inspire, the, this was organized by something called the Long Range Foundation, which was, uh, now it sounds to me like the 100-year uh, Starship uh, <laughs> organization. Their charter said, don't do anything that will bring a return in less than seven generations. And they were doing things like sending a fleet of starships out. And uh, the benefit of this uh, was that they had found since telepathy goes faster than light, in fact, instantaneously, they use that as the principle for the next generation of, of ships that went, then went instantaneously out to uh, pick up the crews from these low lumbering speed of light mm -hmm. starships. But anyway, um, then in the seventh grade, I wandered into the uh, adult stacks in the Hartford, uh, Connecticut Public Library, and there was a book by Stephen Dole called Habitable Planets for Man, which is a RAND Corporation study of which of the nearby stars would be the best um, suitable for, to, to host Earth-like planets. And I devoured that book, and, and uh, um, uh, Robert Heinlein and Stephen Dole had converged on the best choices nearby. Um, and only later did I wonder, um, aren't we going to send women too? Uh, that would be a, you know, how, how, so I wondered that how about, first. How about, it? <laughs> how about, how about are, and, or the question is, should men be allowed to go at all? <laughs>
<laughs> since, since you can reproduce the human race without guys, but not without exactly. the girls. Yeah. So, okay. Where are the just, just so we're clear. So, so last, last night you, uh, you said about Alpha Centauri being the, the first choice. It's a pair of solar-like stars uh, four light years away, and it's the answer to crossword puzzles. What's the, the nearest star system? And um, it was, it's a little iffy because it's a double star system. I'll come back to that in a second. The next two solar type stars are, probably uh, half the people in here know this, uh, Epsilon Eridani and Tau Ceti. Uh, Tau Ceti was the destination of the, uh, the Time for the Stars novel. Um, it's a G star that's 12 light years away, and uh, Lewis and Clark Starship went there as its first stop. And uh, those two stars were the first targets of uh, Frank Drake's uh, SETI research, uh, the first listening project, 15 minutes or so on each star, or something like that, not very long, uh, listening to those two nearest solar type single stars, Epsilon Airy and Tau Ceti. And uh, uh, we ha know a lot more about them now. Um, we know, uh, I was privileged to be part of uh, uh, a team that used the Spitzer Space Telescope to study both of those stars, and we found that Eps Airy has a uh, architecture like our system. It has a Jupiter-like planet with an asteroid belt next to it. It has a Kuiper belt an outer, uh, beyond the um, uh, outermost zone, about the same size as ours. And, uh, and then a, a comet or asteroid belt, we couldn't tell which, at about the position of Uranus. So that's a, a, a really similar system to ours. We don't know about the Earth-like planets. It's not, it's not uh, presented edge on, so we're not seeing transits, and we can't detect Earth-sized planets yet, but we, there's a Jupiter in there. Um, a problem, it's uh, the star system is 0.8 billion years old, and it's, uh, we detected it with Spitzer because it's at the end of the heavy bombardment phase. So it's hard hat weather at, uh, at Epps Airy, and so I wouldn't go there necessarily <laughs> as my first choice. Uh, but Tau Ceti, uh, Heinlein's choice, um, as a G star that's about uh, 7 billion years old, and uh, it also has a Kuiper belt, uh, much uh, faded relative to, uh, to uh, Eps Aries. So that's, uh, that's probably the pretty, uh, pretty good choice. Now, back to Alpha Centauri, though, at only four light years distance. Um, so the two stars, the uh, G star and the K star, orbit each other um, at about the distance that Uranus is from the sun in our system, so that, so that's like the scale of, of a planetary system, that sort of looks dangerous. So I <laughs> called up my favorite dynamicist and said, could a planet in a habitable zone around either of those stars stay in a stable orbit for billions of years, given that there's a whole other star, just 20 AU over there, actually in an eccentricity 0.5 orbit, which is also kind of scary. And his answer was, Jack Lissauer as the, uh, the guy, says, yes, that would be stable. You could do both of those habitable zones. You could put a planet in and stay there for, for billions of years. However, not obvious that the planets could assemble to start with. That's a different problem. You could, you could take a point mass and put it in there now, and it would stay put. But whether you could, uh, with, with two stars rolling around each other uh, at that short distance, whether the protostellar disk would be chewed up or not is not clear. And we can't check this one easily with infrared, our present infrared technology, Alpha Centauri, because it's presented against a very dense piece of the Milky Way, so there's a huge background signal, and we, uh, the, uh, you know, Spitzer burned out basically trying to look at Alpha mm -hmm. Centauri. So we get something with higher spatial resolution like SOFIA uh, and, and look at it eventually. So, um, uh, but for now, Alpha Centauri, it's five billion years old, so that's, that's okay. We don't know uh, whether it's, it gets, it's got planets or, or asteroid belts, Kuiper belts, that show that there are planets have assembled. It ends up being Tau Ceti at 12 light years is uh, <coughs> looking like still the, uh, the, the best choice. Then there's, um, I was a co-author on a paper that was led by Jill Tarter, the, uh, the uh, Ceti Institute's uh, uh, director of the, of the search project. Uh, that had um, uh, revisited the question of whether low mass stars, M stars, um, could be hosts for habitable planets. The argument had always been that to be at liquid water temperature around such a low luminosity star, the planet would have to be so close that its rotation would lock as Mercury's 
is locked in a two-thirds resonance, or if it's circular orbit, it's a one-to-one, -one. and then you're in trouble because the atmosphere goes and freezes out on the cold pole of your planet, and that's no fun for anyone. So M stars were usually not considered as, the, as good uh, prospects, but there's uh, now revisited, if the atmosphere is at least as thick as the Earth's, it carries the heat around. The, the atmosphere super rotates and uh, d redistributes the heat. So you can have the planet locked, and the atmosphere carries, carries the heat around and doesn't freeze, maybe. Okay, so that. So we, uh, if you want to go to M stars, the next two down are go by catalog numbers of the uh, astronomers who who uh, picked them out in the, uh, two or three centuries ago, La, La, La Cale 9352 and La Landa 21185. Those are the next uh, fairly obscure next choices down. But when we go there, if, when the starship sets out, we'll already know whether there's some place to go because as, as Seth Shostak points out, there'll be the technology to examine in, in detail the surfaces of those planets by the time uh, we're ready to send the ship out there. So it won't be a launch into the dark like so many of the science fiction uh, novels have, have been. You, uh, so um, May, where are we going? Which one are we going? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm well, gonna, look, 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 uh, yes, sorry. Then, Wait, uh, one, just two, two minutes on, on, on how many people or who to pick. Um, so you, your, your, your point was about the psychology of uh, how many people would you have to bring along before uh, that were, there weren't uh, you know, uh, uh, conflicts uh, from just being crowded in the same space for 60, 100 years with a small population. But biologically, there's a paper by um, uh, Hey, H-E-Y et al, Rutgers, uh, June 2005, uh, and I can give the full citation later for anyone who wants it, the, uh, the main wave of colonization of, of North and South America over the Bering Land Bridge, uh, most, uh, there were three waves, but the one that populated most of the, of the Western Hemisphere consisted of 70 people. Uh, and everyone in the, in the uh, you know, both continents, uh, native to both continents is descended from about 70. You can work that out from the genet uh, lack of genetic diversity in the, in the the current inhabitants. So biologically, you can if you and, and you could probably knock that down a bit if you uh, were careful, you know, to have a wide variety of people, uh, you know, to start with. And, and I was going to say of, if you were instead, reckless, you instead, could knock it's, 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 instead, instead, it's, instead of people who were already related to each other as they crossed the bridge, right? And they have se seventy people were enough to produce uh, two continents worth of of healthy. Uh, healthy people 15,000 years later. So that's, uh, that's my, my second point. And isn't that problem solved if you just take along donors' genetic material with you to yeah. inject into the uh, yeah. genetic Well, I'm, okay, I'm, before we get carried away <laughs> here, okay, let's, 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 let's I, I feel like I have to step in here. Uh, the reason why I'm stepping in is because what's really exciting about this Project 100 Year Starship is because people are have so many opinions and think that there's a way to do it. And this is a very reasonable thing to do. That's what's really exciting about it. I want to go back for a second and just tell you, again, what 100-Year Starship is, the foundation that we created. It is not about necessarily saying this is exactly what's going to happen, but rather, how do, we, how do we get the technologies in place? So we think about the various kinds of propulsions. You asked the question, what were some of the long poles? And I'm going to come back to that. But the first thing I want to say is that in order for this to happen, people have to see people everybody have to see how it applies to the earth right now. How does it transform? How does it make a difference to us? Now, some of us in this room probably we could, we'll hold, I'll hold my breath for, you know, a long time. And as long as we get these technologies done, as long as I get a chance to go, it's all right. I'll spend the money. We can spend the money. But a lot of people don't feel that way. It needs to have some direct application now. So it's not only just helping us go to Mars. Right, as because we have to do those incre some incremental steps, we have to do some testing, but it also helps to transform our world. One of the l incredibly long poles in the tent will be self-renewing systems, because you're gonna. I don't know how long it's gonna take, but wherever you go, you might have to carry enough to be able to live on from now on. 
right? So self-renewing systems become very important. Imagine what would happen to our planet if we learned enough about self-renewing systems, the knowledge that we could apply here on Earth. That's a very important long pole in terms of technology. Now, we made a joke about the behavior and how people act, but behavior mechanisms makes a really big difference because that's something we haven't figured out yet, right? If we, you know, the changing politics, all of those kinds of things really make a big difference. Um, but I, I wasn't trying to poo-poo it. It's a real Yeah, it's a really makes problem. No, no, I mean, we, 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 we talk about, but we can apply that. As we learn about, because you don't want to just send everybody blind, but we want to understand how these things happen. Our task, again, for 100-year starship is to say along the way, let's make sure that we apply these back on any of these technologies, we apply them back on Earth. I put a couple of little notes over here. Um, uh, just in terms of, you talked about uh, the genetic variability and all of those kinds of things of the people we want to want to send. So genetic variability is only one of the components. The other components, what is a so, what is the sociocultural <laughs> norms that you're going to send? What are the religious norms that are going to go along with it? How do those influence the behavior? We haven't figured out. We have a whole big world here to share. We haven't figured out how to deal with those kinds of issues yet. But it makes a really big difference as we evaluate and go through and then how do we apply this information back to our world? Okay, we're going to, uh, thanks mate, that was fantastic. Um, we're going to open the floor for some questions. We, if so, put up your hand if, and the guy will come around and give you the mic and then you can uh, address the... My question is for uh, Mr. Rhodes. It, considering that the best and the brightest built the bomb, I'm wondering, should we project ourselves out there? As you said, unintentional <laughs> consequences. Protect ourselves from... Project ourselves, you know, in other... Uh, should we? Oh. Our capacity for destruction, you know, the as I said, the best and the brightest built the bomb. I mean, should we I go on? I don't understand what you're saying. Protect us from what? No, project. Quick. Should we Should we go on? Should we... Uh, what Bill was saying about the conflict. Oh, oh, I see. Because well. we suck so badly. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, uh, that was the short version. Well, you know, it's... As is usual with human beings, it's really not should we. we, we we're going to if we can, uh, because that's what we do. The question really is, what are we going to do at the other end? Uh, we've had various ways of dealing with alien forces, if you will. The, the, the first time around in the discovery of, the, of North and South America was basically to try to kill as many of the natives as possible, one way or the other. But I do have a, an alternative, which I like a lot, which is what happened after the end of the Second World War when Papua New Guinea became an Australian trust territory. The homicide rate in Papua New Guinea, historically and prehistorically, has been around 600 per 100,000. Understand the United States today is 5.4 per 100,000. Europe is about one per 100,000. 600 per 100,000. Papua New Guinea was a bloody, bloody place. There were no systems in place to deal with, to deal with social conflict, basically, except violence. And the response to the Australians arriving with their red judicial robes and their wigs was, thank God, you're going to, I'm so tired of watching my back. Uh, unfortunately, eventually, the, the, the Australian court system left Papua New Guinea, and it has to some degree reverted to its previous levels of violence. But we may find cultures far more violent than ours when we, when we go out there and look around. So I don't think we can protect ourselves from ourselves, unfortunately. Let's hope, however, that the historic decline in violence that has happened in the West and really in much of the world over the last 600 years will continue and that the people we send will be considerably less conflict prone, if you will, than even we are today. I, I have to make an exception to the premise of your question. You made a premise that the best and the brightest are the ones who created the bomb. These are the people who were chosen and had the opportunity to create the bomb. And a lot of times scientists and others do things because that's what they're given the opportunity to. But you know, every technology is just a tool. 
and we get to decide how we use our tools and our information. There are people who have not been involved in the sciences, which is a very reason that we use the term inclusion at the very beginning, because we get a chance to decide how we use our knowledge and the tools that we create based on that knowledge. So there were the best and the brightest of that particular group of people who created the bomb and who decided the bomb was necessary. Not necessarily the best and the brightest of all humanity are the best in terms of, of moral, morality, even the best necessarily in terms of how you can apply things. It was being created at a time of war. So I think that you know the premise mm. that um, <laughs> this is who we're gonna be, and this is who we always are, is a little bit overstated. And I would also say that, you know, from my perspective, as you come and you talk about what we encountered, every society didn't necessarily act the same way as Western Europe. There were societies who, when they first came to, the, to over here, they were already here when Western Europe got here. So we have to not, not get we have to keep our perspective in terms of what we have to choose from on sure. this planet, that we have an incredible wealth of possibilities, and we need to bring and all of that swath of possibilities into play. This question about the scientists who built the bomb is a question for another time and place, but just one quick statement about it. They worked on that project because they were fairly confident that Nazi Germany was working on that project. Okay. And the concept of Adolf Hitler having a thousand year Reich in place controlled by nuclear weapons was horrific to everyone who even heard of the idea. What we did later is another question to be sure. The other point being, and this is true in general with science and why I'm sure this starship will happen at some point, scientists worked on fission because it was there to be worked on. It, was, it wasn't something they could all get together and say, oh, let's not do this. That was where science was at that point. If it hadn't been discovered in Nazi Germany in 1938, it would have been discovered in 20 other places within a matter of days from the time the discovery took place. And fission could be used for lots of other Indeed, things, from nuclear, powering for powering, for powering starships, <laughs> for, for nuclear energy, for uh, lots of other different things. We get a choice. And another thing we don't have a choice in, is to follow that up, is if you uh, choose not to explore, not to look up and out, what does that say about you? It's probably not very good. I claim that the humans that came before us that did not have that desire to look out and up became food for some of other nature's <laughs> uh, organisms. That's just in us. We can't, that's going to be hard to change. That's a good question, though. Yeah. I think we have a mic at the back there. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that there's uh, avenues to uh, work on in terms of propulsion. But to me, the real question has always been life support. So uh, short of my only solution, which is to take a, build a giant terrarium and take a slice of Earth with us to you know, grow and breathe on, uh, short of packing that with the one thing that we cannot find anywhere else that we know of in the cosmos, we can find water and we can find oxygen and hydrogen and probably heavy metal someplace. The one thing we will never find that we can think of outside of the biosphere is the, I don't know, million tons of living topsoil we would need to pack a spaceship with to take it someplace if it's going to grow and live and heave people on board for a century or two or three centuries. Maybe we get someplace, we decide it's not suitable, we're gonna have to stay, as someone mentioned earlier, on our starship for a while. So does anyone have anything to say about the question of life support and uh, the staggering prospect of having to build an imitation biosphere to cart around with us? So part, of, so part of the issue in terms of this is doing the research to try to understand those pieces. Right now, uh, all of our agriculture is dependent upon the topsoil, which does include, as we were talking here, the microbes, uh, the biobes that actually do the, the, the nitrogen transformation, those kind of things. So a lot of the, what we're going to have to do is to really understand, even in more detail and depth, what that means, what are the, the kinds of components you can carry with you, and how do you renew and keep that healthy? Because one of the problems would be is even if you scooped up all of that topsoil and you took it there with you, you could actually ruin it and go through it. So how do you revive it? And that's what I mean by the self-renewing systems. That kind of knowledge can then be applied back here on Earth as we destroy our topsoil right now and we get our nitrogen balance off base as we start to talk about growing uh, things so 
anyways, but there, there are lots of different ways that the research becomes fundamentally important to understand you know, you're going to have to create a terrarium. I mean, that's a, that's a simplistic way of saying it, but you're going to have to create something like that somewhere. And once you arrive, you're yes. going to have to be able to either stay in your terrarium mm -hmm. or either going to be able to try to transform wherever you are, at least a bubble or part of it, into a terrarium. Well, that was biosphere too, right? And, 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 was the, as the saying goes, we, yes. this is a microbes world we just live in. <laughs> You may recall that Biosphere 2 turned out to be an absolute oh, disaster. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we have a lot more to learn about closed terrarium systems and how you maintain them in a stable state. Uh, do we have another mic question? Uh, I'm just curious about what uh, DARPA, the Department of Defense, what interest they have in uh, interstellar <laughs> travel and exploration and colonization. Yes. So, so I, I'll, I'll pick that up. So, <laughs> so, so why is this there? One of the, the concerns they had was really the amount of the, the revitalization of science in this nation. During the Apollo program, just the possibility of doing that grand challenge, really it increased the number of people who were going into science, technology, engineering, mathematics kinds of fields, just almost exponentially. They didn't necessarily become uh, people who worked with NASA, but the field was revitalized. So when DARPA was thinking about this, the idea was how do we um, revitalize and boost science and technology? How do we create more innovation? Because you see, a lot of the things now that we're so jazzed about in terms of innovation, whether it's the biotech and um, some of the material science, it's really based on work that was done in the 1960s and the 1970s, even maybe back to the 1950s. We aren't doing that as much now. So they wanted to say, is there a grand challenge? Is there something that we can do that's going to revitalize the sciences in this country? Just the knowledge application, as we start to learn about energy generation, which is fundamentally at that propulsion question, and it's also fundamentally as to what do you do for energy on your way there? That changes things here. As we start to look at um, closed systems, behavioral psychology, we look at human performance, we look at human physiology. Those things start to change um, who we are. We have to understand some very fundamental questions, and that's that revitalization that then, you know, you probably know that the military actually benefited quite a bit from space exploration and some of the things that were learned. So it really does have a connection, even though our organization has nothing to do with you know, generating necessarily military information. We're actually looking at how do we create the, the capabilities and the technology. Well, one side of the story is there are a couple of guys at the Air Force, U.S. Air Force, who thought this was a cool thing. And so the Air Force nowadays is mostly in space. <clears throat> Most of what the Air Force does is in outer space. So the kind of person that becomes a general in the U.S. Air Force investigating outer space is another guy who read science fiction and dreams big. So it was one thing led to another. And I just, I, if I may remind everybody, the going to the moon was a result of the Cold War. It, I mean, you can tell yourself it was to do these things because we were hard and we were visionary and back in the good old days we tried things. It was the Cold War. But now we have the ability, as a, if I can use the term spin-off of this, to, uh, to investigate these deep questions. Where did we come from and are we alone? It has led to wonderful science. So when I read the 100-year Starship proposal, it really, for me, as a reader, had that quality. People, let's just dream big. Let's just do something big. And so that's uh, the kind of people that have access to, I won't say limitless budgets, but large budgets nowadays are at the U.S. Defense Department. What we used to call, when my mother uh, was in the Navy, it was called the Department of War. Now it's called the Department <laughs> of Defense. <laughs> May, you talked about the importance of engaging artists in this project. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about that and also if that refers to some kind of public campaign, what that might look like. So the first thing is 
there's an emotional connection that people have, right? How do you transfer that emotional, emotional connection? I think that art is that way of helping us understand the world around us from a personal perspective. And I think that artists have an incredible place in helping transfer that information. Artists um, can tell the stories, right? They can, I mean, everyone who's up here has talked about science fiction. There's some kind of way that we've related to it. You know, science fiction movies are popular, right? They're popular, right? They're probably some of the most popular movies out there because they tell a story and they get us involved. And it's also the visual pieces. The music gets us involved. So I think artists have an incredibly big role to play because they can record and see and observe things about the world that we don't see in other ways. What are we doing to involve that? I think there are, um, there have been some artists who came on board who said that they would actually commit to producing different kinds of, of paintings and works. We're actually going to be putting together some programs to work with, ch with children to do writing and art competitions. Um, we will be using this as going forward all the way because the, it, it tells a story. Um, artists have looked up at the night sky and wondered what it, what it was. They've produced pictures and images. They've called us our attention to so many things. So I can't tell you exactly how they're being involved, but I want them there with us. I want them there with me. And it's an extraordinary time, you guys, through space exploration. It brings people together. We are living at a time when we discovered that everybody is from East Africa, that there's, everybody's a human. And this didn't used to be the case. I mean, people started the Cold War or people started wars because of xenophobia, the fear of outsiders. But uh, art, artists uh, without language can bring people together. It's just an extraordinary time. It's an extraordinary time. This could, dare I say it, change the world. <laughs> Okay, we've got time for just one more quick question just down there's, here. There's one young woman in the back who's had her hand up a long time in the and red, red, red in the red yeah. sweater in the back. She's had her hand up for a long there's time. Well, it's maybe it's more of a, a pullover. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree that this project is a good idea, but what happens when the other generations are, say, born in other star systems? Is that necessarily right for them to be born there, but yet want to still come here even though they never will be able to? Say the, say the last part again. Is that right? Is that right for those generations who are stuck in another star system, even if they want to come back to Earth, but they, but they can't? So part of, part of the reason why we have to have so many people involved are to ask those kinds of questions. That's an ethical question that we have to ask. Some people might answer, well, they'll have to take care of that when they get there. Other people will say, well, we can't make that decision for them. But those are some of the ethical issues. I can't tell you what the answer ought to be. But I know that there probably will be people at some point in time who are born in other star systems we don't know if there's going to be a return trip or how that return trip happens. Um, but it is an ethical issue. That's the reason it's so important for us to understand how cultures change. Cultures, sometimes cultures go along and they're very similar. If you look at the transition of Europeans to the United States, some of those cultures survived. They were, had an active survival. If you look at Africans coming to the United States on slave ships, many, many of African cultural isms actually survived even though they were actively discouraged here in the US. So there will be cultural transitions. All of those things will occur. I can't give you the right or wrong of that, but it is a question we need to ask and spend some time thinking about. And anyway, whoever got to choose where he was born how many times have all of us said to a parent, I didn't ask to be born. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm working in a well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that, uh, on that mark, we'll uh, end this panel. And I know that there are a lot more questions out there, so please feel free to come up after the talk. Thanks very much.
Thank you. You're welcome. Do you still want to be you, you serious? Yeah. Okay. Keep in touch. Okay. okay. Please. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. We'll find out how to do it.